It's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, I want to do two things. First, to tell you about the discovery of essential fatty acids, and secondly, to tell you how it came about that omega-3 fatty acids were determined to be essential fatty acids. So let's begin by going back in time 100 years. The major question in biochemistry 100 years ago was whether dietary fat was an essential nutrient. And this was controversial. And the two most famous biochemists in the United States at that time were Thomas Osborne and Lafayette Mendel. They were working as a team in New Haven, Connecticut, where, uh, where Mendel was the head of uh, physiological chemistry at Yale University and a Sterling professor. Both were members of the National Academy. Both were, had been presidents of the American Bio Biochemical Society. And they worked on this problem for seven years, published a number of papers, and came up with a conclusion in 1920 that fat is necessary in the diet because it provides essential lipoids, which today we know are fat-soluble vitamins. But the fat itself, the true fat, was not a required dietary nutrient. And in 1980, George Burr, in a perspective, said, we had been told by the high authorities that fat was not required in the diet, and our minds were closed. And of course, George Burr was the person who discovered essential fatty acids. Now, Burr was born in 1896 in the western frontier of the United States, and he went to college in a small school in Arkansas called Hendricks College, graduated in 1916 with a bachelor's degree. And for the next six years, he had many different jobs, and he uh, even served a term in the Army. And he showed that he was willing to take chances, and he, he participated in some ventures. And in 1922, he obtained a, a scholarship to go to graduate school at the University of Minnesota, got a PhD in uh, 1924 where, for his work on proteins. And he was an excellent student and got a highly competitive National Research Council postgraduate fellowship. And he used the fellowship to work with Herbert Evans at the University of California. Now, in, in the 1920s, vitamins was a key subject in nutrition and biochemistry. It was the forefront. And Evans had gotten a lot of notoriety for his discovery with Bishop in 1922 of the anti-sterility factor, which we now know as vitamin E. Evans was a physiologist. And he needed a biochemist to isolate this factor and determine what it was. So it was a perfect match. Burr was the biochemist. Evans was the, was the physiologist. And Burr began to characterize the chemical properties of vitamin E. And in his own words, in this retrospective, he tells us that he began to study dietary fat just by chance. And here's what happened. As Burr characterized his fractions, he needed vitamin E deficient rats in order to test them. And the Evans lab lost the ability to produce vitamin E deficient rats. And they figured out that it was due to the fact that they weren't extracting all of the vitamin E from the diet. So Evans gave Burr the job of really extract all the vitamin E. Burr did a wonderful job. He extracted all the fat. And when they fed the fat to the animals, the animals developed a disease. And this disease was different from vitamin E deficiency. And at first, Evans was very excited about this because he thought he had discovered a new fat-soluble vitamin. 
and two papers were published, both with Evans as first author. And then they did a little bit more work on this, and Burr began to show Evans that it was the fat that was the essential factor. And Evans lost interest in it. He said, fat is not important. It's so commonplace. Nobody's going to be interested in this. Stop work on this and go back to work on vitamin E. But Burr was a curious fella, and he thought that this was important. And by that time, he was coming to the end of his fellowship, and he contacted the University of Minnesota, and they were happy. They had a position. They were happy to take him back as an assistant professor. And he went back in 1928, and within a year, he published a classic paper that fat is essential, is a, an essential constituent of the rat diet. And this is the famous figure taken from the paper, which shows that it's the fatty acid which is the essential component. And he followed this up in 1930 with a second paper in, where he showed that when he fed oils that were rich in linoleic acid, the omega the parent of the omega-6 family, it cured the essential fatty acid deficiency. So in 1930, he coined the term essential fatty acid, and he said that linoleic acid is an essential fatty acid. And this is the famous figure from that paper. I want you to notice two things about this. These papers are by George and Mildred Burr, and this is a very interesting story. Mildred was George's wife. George came to the University of Minnesota. They set him up with a rat colony in a separate building from where his office was. And they, he got a small grant from the graduate college. This, this was in the late 1920s. It was enough to buy supplies, but there's no way that an assistant professor who has all the beginning academic duties could handle a rat colony in another building. He needed an assistant. He didn't have enough money to hire an assistant. So his wife, Mildred, said, well, I'll, I'll come in as a volunteer, and I'll take care of the rats. And in the process of doing this, she managed the study, and she made many of the discoveries of the pathological effects of essential fatty acid deficiency, and therefore enough to become a co-author of the papers, and, and she and George are the co-author of these classic papers. Now today we think of them as classic papers, landmark discoveries in lipid research, but that wasn't the case in, in the late 1920s. The, this was a very controversial finding, and many of the great labs in, in biochemistry set out to prove Burr wrong. Here was an assistant professor, a young person, just starting out, and he's disproving the great Osborne and Mendel. So, Burr figured he'd better do something to defend his, his study, and he did another study in, in 1931. He showed that carbohydrate could be converted to fat. This was the reason that people thought that fat wasn't essential in the diet. And then he demonstrated that carbohydrate could not be converted to linoleic acid and therefore, that helped to prove that linoleic acid was an essential fatty acid. So by 1931, Burr discovered essential fatty acids. He discovered that the omega-6 fatty acids were essential and proved that they were physiologically essential. But he made another discovery in this paper. He showed that carbohydrate also could not be converted to alpha-linolenic acid the parent of the omega-3 family. So Burr proved that alpha-linolenic acid was biochemically essential, but he had to then determine whether it really was physiologically essential. So he and Mildred did another study in 1932, and this is a figure from that paper where he showed that, that linolenate was able to stimulate the growth of rats on an essential fatty acid deficient diet. And in 32, he concluded that both the omega-3 linolenic acid and linoleic acid are effective in curing the disease. 
and he said that they both seem to be about of equal value. And this is how Burr got into trouble. Because as the 30s went on, people, other people could confirm his linoleic acid findings, but they couldn't confirm the linolenic acid findings. And in uh, one of the main labs that couldn't confirm it in 1938 was the group, uh, including Eleanor Hume, and they found, that this is the group in London, who found that linolenic acid was only one-sixth as potent as linoleic acid in stimulating weight gain in rats and healing the lesions in the skin of essential fatty acid deficiency. And even worse, in 1942, the lab of Harry Steenbach, and Steenbach was famous for his work on the synthesis of vitamin D stimulated by sunlight in the skin. So this was a famous laboratory at Wisconsin. He did a study, his group did a study, and he found that linolenic acid does not cure the skin symptoms and doesn't make normal reproduction possible in essential fatty acid deficiency. And based on this, the biochemical and scientific community as a whole lost interest in omega-3 fatty acids. In the 40s and in the 50s, into the 60s even, the idea was that omega-6 linoleic acid was the essential fatty acid and linolenic really was not important physiologically. Fortunately, there was very little work going on on omega-3 fatty acids except in a few laboratories. And one of the studies was done by Ralph Holman. This is Ralph. Ralph was a student of Burr's. And he determined that linolenic acid was converted to an omega-3 fatty acid with five double bonds and an omega-3 fatty acid with six double bonds. This was a very important discovery. And then in 1953, Walter Lindbergh's lab discovered the structure of the hexaene as DHA. In 1958, Ernst Klenk, working in Germany, demonstrated that DHA was very high in the brain. And this is a chromatogram, uh, an old-fashioned chromatogram that uh, Klenk's lab carried out showing that 43% of the polyenes in the ox brain uh, was uh, dexa, DHA. And then subsequently, Clank worked out the pathway from alpha-linolenic acid to DHA and showed that EPA, the five double bond fatty acid that Holman had detected, was an intermediate in the pathway. This pathway was discovered in 1960 it's still viable today, except for the last step in the animal, which Clank thought was a direct conversion of the five, carbon five, uh, five double bond 22 carbon fatty acid to DHA. We now know that in the mammal, in the animal, it's a much more complicated step that involves 24 carbon fatty acids and retroconversion. But this was the pathway that Clank worked out. And the next advance came with EPA in 1964. Bergstrom and Samuelson, early in 64, were one of the groups that discovered that prostaglandin E2 came from arachidonic acid. And this is a figure taken from the, the paper that, uh, that they published. Within several months after making that discovery, they determined that EPA also was converted to a prostaglandin. They also found that the 20 carbon three double bond precursor of arachidonic acid was converted to prostaglandin E1. Now this is a tremendous discovery, a great discovery because it showed that omega-3 fatty acids can give rise to a lipid biomediator. Well, I show you just the, the picture, the, the structures that they showed, 
But in, in the other discoveries, I've shown you the actual data. Why is there no, why don't I show you the, the data that uh, Bergstrom and Samuelson obtained for this? And the reason is there is no figure in the paper showing this conversion. Everything deals with the omega-6 fatty acids, which they viewed as essential fatty acids, being converted to these very potent lipid biomediators. And hence, this very important discovery in terms of omega-3 fatty acids really didn't propel the field any further. Subsequently, it was very important, but at the time, it really had no impact on omega-3 fatty acids because they, like everyone else, were focused on the omega-6 field. Well, I gotta go back, which I guess is this. The next advance came with DHA, and that occurred in the early 70s when Gene Anderson demonstrated that DHA was in the retina was necessary for optimum visual acuity. And in this uh, figure from uh, Anderson's paper, there is uh, less visual uh, acuity, less uh, excitation of the electroretinogram in the DHA deficient animals. And this became a very important um, observation because it demonstrated that an omega-3 fatty acid had a vital functional effect in the nervous system. Following this, the, the next advance was made on EPA by Philip Needleman. Needleman showed that it, it was known that arachidonic acid was converted to a thromboxane, which is a, another form of a prostaglandin molecule. And Needleman demonstrated that when he gave human platelets arachidonic acid, the platelets aggregated. It was due to the thromboxane A2 that was made from the arachidonic acid. When Needleman gave the platelets EPA, the platelet, thromboxane A3 was formed, but thromboxane A3 did not aggregate platelets. And even when he went up to six times the concentration of arachidonic acid that he used, he didn't get any aggregation. And in terms of vascular contraction, he had to go up to 20 times the amount of arachidonic acid before he got any vascular contraction from the EPA derivative. Now this also was a, a very important finding because it demonstrated that EPA did something different than arachidonic acid, but just like Bergstrom and Samuelson, Needleman was focused on arachidonic acid and the prothrombotic effects of arachidonic acid. He, he and as, as well as everyone else who, who was working in the field and who recognized these data, focused on the prothrombotic effects and didn't have much to say about the antithrombotic effects of EPA. And then all of this came together by the work of the Danish group of Bang and Dierberg. In, in the early 1970s, Bang and Dierberg did their famous studies in the Greenland Eskimos. And based on these studies, they concluded that a long chain fatty acid from marine mammals might have an essential bearing on the difference in morbidity from coronary artery disease. In 1978, they did, Dierborg did his famous experiment published in Lancet where he showed that platelets when exposed to ADP aggregate, arachidonic acid stimulates the aggregation and EPA prevents it. And this was the key finding, and 
more important, it not only was a key finding, but it was the, the group, Dearborn understood the importance and the significance of the finding, and it happened at the right time, because in the late 1970s, vascular biology was focused on two things, coronary artery disease and thrombosis. And here was a substance, an omega-3 fatty acid, that appeared to explain the protective effect of the marine lipids on coronary artery disease, and it prevented thrombosis. And this was the thing that propelled omega-3 fatty acids into the forefront of biology, where it not only was a, a subject that a few lipid labs were studying, but everybody wanted to know about EPA and omega-3 fatty acids. And so, in conclusion, when we think about the discovery of essential fatty acids, Burr discovered essential fatty acids. He not only discovered the biochemical essentiality, but in the terms of linoleic acid, the omega-6 fatty acid, he discovered the functional essentiality of it. And he did it within the course of three years. He had all the evidence. He also discovered the, uh, the biochemical essentiality of linolenic acid, and he presented data showing that alpha-linolenic acid had functional physiological essentiality, but his data, and he made the right conclusion that, that omega-3 fatty acids were essential fatty acids, but the conclusion was not substantiated by others who tried to test this, and therefore, for a 20-year period from, the, from 1931 to about 1950, there was no real advance scientifically in establishing the importance of omega-3 fatty acids. And then in 50, Ralph Holman made the key discovery that alpha-linolenic acid was converted to the 5 and 6 double bond omega-3. Then Klenk, working in Germany, showed that the hexaene was the DHA, which is the hexaene, was rich in the brain and determined that these two fatty acids were interconnected. Then Gene Anderson showed that DHA was vital for physiological function in the nervous system. And finally, Dearborg showed that EPA was the principle that prevented platelet aggregation and therefore was antithrombotic and probably was the protective factor against coronary artery disease. There are many people, many additional people, who contributed to the discovery of the essentiality of omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, I've, I've even mentioned a few that I've, I've left out of, of this uh, final figure. But I think that when you, when you talk about discovery, the key people who did it are the, the five shown here, Burr, Holman, Clank, Anderson, and Dearborn. And these are the giants on which you and I stand on their shoulders. Thank you very much, and I'll be very happy at the end to answer your questions.